You're listening to Copy Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Taylor Baig, Chief Economist. Welcome to our 83rd episode. Today's guest, or I should say return guest, is Munib Madni, CEO of Singapore-based Panarchy Partners. A few years ago, Munib transitioned from a career in traditional buy-side fund management to setting up a firm that seeks to redefine the notion of wealth and its creation. We talked about all this and more in Kopi Time back in 2020 in episode 16. Uh, I think both Panarchy Partners and Kopi Time have come a long way since then. Uh, in preparation for this podcast, I went back and listened to that episode. To those of you who haven't, please do by all means. It's a terrific primer on a company's purpose. And Munib really draws from history as well as economic and finance theory to underscore that point. And also in that podcast, you will hear Munib delving into sustainability-driven fund management, focusing on returns and progress on four forms of capital, human, social, environmental, and financial. In today's podcast, we will focus on the third capital, environmental, and the investment side guys around that. With that context in place, Munib Madni, welcome back to Kopi Time. Hi, Tamar. Good to be back. Uh, feels like a long time ago. It was early days of COVID. Yeah, indeed. Um, Munib, uh, we had you in the show, I think, just a little more than two years ago. So what have you and Panarchy Partners been up to during that time? Yeah, the last two years, uh, as you know, it seems like uh, during COVID, uh, the, you know, uh, everything kind of went silent and went very quiet. But I've got to say that what, uh, you know, while the human humanitarian crisis uh, that was happening unfolding both on a personal and a professional level, it impacted many, many people. And, and you know, uh, even at Panaki Partners, uh, sadly, we had our own losses. Uh, we had uh, our co-founder, uh, Christian Droll, pass away in a tragic uh, incident. Um, but, you know, the team has come out of uh, COVID, um, you know, stronger. I'm proud that we've kind of delivered on the the purpose that uh, for which Panaki Partners was built. Uh, we've been sort of diligently uh, executing on our uh, purpose of having um, capital owners and users come together um, to make a bit, place a better world. And then uh, our own investing process has evolved since the last time we spoke and we've incorporated purpose uh, into uh, how our portfolio companies are judged. And I, I'm glad to say that, you know, that, that that's been a, a sort of a positive uh, sort of um, you could say uh, a progress for uh, Panaki uh, since we last met. As a B Corp, um, we've been playing a very important role, we believe, uh, in building the sustainable investing ecosystem in Singapore. Uh, we've had uh, almost 30 interns now with us over the last four years since we started. Uh, and and we ha we're having our second global Pandas forum. So building and uh, shaping the sustainable investing uh, ecosystem, not only in Singapore and Asia, is very important. Uh, and I think, you know, the last thing is, and where we are right now, is that the, the team has actually uh, broadened its investment focus from sustainable investing. And now we're focusing and moving towards uh, investing with environmental impact. Um, if you recall, my team and myself um, have got uh, and, and spent a lot of time on environmental capital and thus this call. Uh, and the team is now ready uh, to help our clients deliver on some of the environmental ambitions that they have uh, through their investments. So we're, we're, we're nicely placed uh, in a world that may, most probably is not that nicely placed at the moment. Indeed. Uh, I, I would like to devote today's podcast and setting that context and getting deep into the issue of climate investing. So let's start by you helping us understand what is climate change in the context of markets and what is climate investing. Yeah. So first, uh, climate change in terms of the markets. Uh, if you recall last time uh, when we spoke, uh, Temur, we, we, we talked about externalities. You know, that was a big part of the conversation we had was that many of the externalities, uh, human, social, environmental, that were outsourced by companies and, in, uh, and investors just took it as it was, they were being internalized. Uh, one of the biggest externalities, the mother of all negative environmental externalities is climate change. Uh, and I think that's where in the context of the markets, uh, climate change is, could be seen as a failure, a failure of markets to incorporate, internalize uh, this very expensive cost uh, that is now not only a cost for, for the current generation, but for the future generations as well. And and I think that's an important sort of, uh, you know, uh, 
realization that the world is having uh, on, on various levels that uh, climate change is a market failure and the markets are now trying to sort of correct for it. And and uh, listen, I don't want to be too hard on the markets. You and I have, have been market participants for the last, you know, almost 30 years now. Uh, and we do believe in, in uh, the, the, the positive value that markets bring. But this whole challenge of climate change it is so broad and global in its nature. Most other externalities can be very, let's say, localized, regionalized, and therefore the cost can be very focused and the markets can become a lot more effective. But I think here the whole challenge is that climate change, the costs are global and also political in nature. Uh, and that, that is where uh, climate change, in, in a way, has been a market failure and for good reasons. It's just a very, very, very tough uh, challenge to deal with. Uh, if you now move towards climate investing, uh, climate investing, it's relatively new. Uh, the, the concept uh, of climate investing, there's no clear definition uh, of climate investing. Uh, if you can, in its essence, is basically uh, investing to help uh, with solutions around climate change. And if you go a bit deeper into it, it's basically investing to help uh, decarbonization. You know, removing carbon uh, uh, from the environment uh, or reducing the output of carbon into the environment and various other emissions. So that is where climate investing has now uh, uh, come to become a topic of discussion on various levels, especially within the investing community. Uh, it is all about uh, investors also, and the good news is the investors are moving from, again, risk and return to risk, return and impact. So in that way, climate investing is different from traditional investing. Here, many of the investors who are actually wanting to invest for climate change are coming with a, with a, with a strong focus on genuine environmental impact uh, towards climate. Uh, if, if you look at climate uh, so investing, uh, I, I would say it's almost at its Gatorade moment. And what I what I what I mean by that is that uh, you know if you look at sports drink, drinks and the phenomena around sports drinks, right? Uh, the first sports drink was Lucas Aid in 1927, and that was for almost athletes that were elite. Uh, by 1965, when Gatorade came about, Gatorade was the first sports drink uh, that was sort of popularized for average athletes. Uh, for anyone who's doing any exercise, Gatorade became the go-to drink for their sports sort of uh, sort of needs. Uh, and I think where that's where we are at now with even climate investing. Uh, Gatorade at that time when it started in 1965, it actually was just sugar, salt, and lemon juice to make it taste a bit better. But it's since then you could say as sports rings have evolved and become isotonic and also very customized, we are going to see that happen with climate investing as well. But at, at this point in time, it's still very early days when we're having this conversation in two years' time when you're doing your 150th uh, <laughs> coffee time. Uh, some of the questions you'll ask me, maybe my answers will be slightly different because it is evolving very quickly. So many, as you know, uh, this is not necessarily a problem in the circle that you and I live in, but there is a huge a uh, community of climate skeptics out there who will challenge the first notion that uh, there's a negative externality that man-made activities are causing the bulk of climate change as some of it is you know something that's a constant through the history of this planet now to those skeptics i mean do we just ignore them or there is a rational for even those people to be part of climate investing uh, yeah i think uh, uh, if, if if you want to sort of uh, bring them on board, you cannot ignore them. Uh, and I think what you need to do is need to understand where that is coming from, uh, right? And I think that is one of the reasons uh, why climate change, climate investing is very politicized. This whole issue of carbon is very political, uh, is exactly that, that a lot of the people who are skeptics are coming from either a fear uh, mm -hmm. of this transition of towards decarbonization uh, impacting uh, and let's face it decarbonization is going to be challenging and expensive uh, from on an economy uh, on companies on individuals and that's why we often talk about just transition so you know the word just transition has also become very topical uh, especially in making sure that as we transition away from fossil fuels and let's say other agricultural practices that are maybe not that uh, positive for the overall environment, that we do it in a way that is just and fair uh, for everyone, not just the global south, 
but also for the developed uh, countries and the various industry that they operate in. And I think the skeptics are either coming from uh, a lack of, let's say, uh, the knowledge around the science behind it, which I think now the skepticism is, especially around climate change, is definitely a, a lot more reduced than it was, let's say, five years ago, 10 years ago. It's pretty much an accepted fact. Now, the size and scale of it can be questioned, the timing of it can be questioned, and the solutions are definitely going to be questioned. But I think it, it's it, the, the few that are left, the skeptics, uh, engaging with them, understanding what is their fear or the concern, that is the one way to deal with this. So I think the two facts, uh, Muni, which is number one, the earth is warming. And number two, there is a linkage between human activities and global warming. Your point is that I think there's not that much room for debate on those two things. The science is pretty solid in, in these areas. Yeah. And, and, and even if, let's say, we are... Uh, Exaggerating it by 50%, this whole uh, idea that temperatures going to 2.5% is going to lead to serious, serious. And, and you know, there have been some studies done that, done that if we don't, let's say no action is taken, uh, by the end of the century, the global economy is going to be l lower than 18% than where it is now. Just the economic damage that can be done uh, is massive uh, for those who want to put it in financial terms. For those who don't want to put it, uh, you know, the, the risk of climate change into financial terms, they just need to see what's happening around the world in terms of temperatures and climates and all the rest and let's say even if what we are doing now helps that incrementally that should be a positive for everyone so i think making it a binary event is gone it's more as you know it's a, it's a scaling issue now uh, for many people in terms of time size effort fear everything right there's a whole spectrum all right how big is climate investing now and even before you answer that question my follow-up to the question is why isn't it bigger yeah. Uh, so uh, climate investing, uh, as I said, if you incorporate in the, in the broader context, it is about decarbonizing or all the efforts. Right. So if you add in all the government uh, aspirations and ambitions and promises, then already we, we're talking in the trillions of dollars. And even going forward, it's going to be trillions of dollars of investments. I think there was a, a Bloomberg uh, a, a article last year that said that to, for us to get to net zero, by 2050, uh, $173 trillion have to be spent uh, in climate investing. Um, in the same vein, there was another research done by a, another research house, and, and they had uh, just China alone needs to spend $165 billion per annum to get to their uh, carbon neutral 2060 target. So the numerics from a government's perspective are massive. Even if you look at the EU Green Deal, the, the latest, uh, you know, the, the, the Inflation Reduction Act of the uh, US, there's big chunks of these that have got climate in it from a government's perspective. So if you look at governments and then even companies that are transitioning their own models, business models and the capex that they're spending internally, that's fairly big already. Now, that is one form of investing. But for the purposes of today, let's say uh, what we're talking about is private individuals, institutions investing in, let's say, carbon and, 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 and climate here. Uh, the, the 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 dollar values are still very relatively low. Uh, Morningstar had a number in April this year that there's roughly 860 funds or ETFs that are out there in the market that are climate or could be called climate related, right? And the total value in that is about 408 billion dollars, according to Morningstar. And that number is doubled in the in 2021, and it's about seven to eight times what it was in 2017. But 408 billion is not very big. It's still very small. It's still very early days. And 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 you know, you asked also what is the reason it's being held back. Uh, I think there's two bottlenecks here. One is the first is that uh, as I mentioned, for climate investing, investors are looking for environmental impact as much as they're looking for risk-adjusted returns. Mm -hmm. The impact, the environmental impact data that people institutional investors, even individual investors are, are, are having at this point in time is, is uh, still uh, coming slowly. It's not well identified and structured enough uh, for these institutional investors who are so used to their risk return uh, frameworks to incorporate that into it. So I think the impact, the more uh, over time, as we get more and more environmental data, 
uh, that can support the impact that investments are making, uh, the more money we're going to see in, into this space, right? Uh, and so that's the first bottleneck. It's just not enough data to prove that the impact an investment is having uh, is there. That's one. Uh, the second one, I would say, is also a lack of genuine um, climate uh, funds and investment vehicles. Uh, even though there were 860 uh, climate uh, or climate related uh, funds and ETFs, as I mentioned, uh, very the, the whole spectrum. The, if you look at this, uh, if you break them down and look at the kind of climate sub actions they were taking, uh, some could argue they were not impactful enough and therefore the investors were not sort of uh, enamored with them. So I think over time, as more and more uh, genuine climate funds come through. People like myself and my team can deliver uh, environmental impact uh, data points that are supportive of investing in climate investing. Uh, you will find that there's going to be more. As I said, we're at the Gatorade moment of climate investing. Uh, we need to get to the isotonics very quickly, and that will happen uh, in, the, in the coming years. So that's they're the two bottlenecks why climate investing, I think, has still been a bit, uh, you know, it's it's growing, but from a very low base. Uh, and it will continue to grow. So, uh, Munir, I'm sure you're aware that this whole ESG complex and climate is, of course, the integral part of that, uh, has received criticism over recent years. You know, the greenwashing aspect, to your point that there are lots of funds out there that are purportedly investing in green activities, uh, but uh, when one looks at the sh stocks that they hold, it doesn't look that impressive. And then we have famously had Elon Musk of Tesla come out and uh, criticize ESG criteria because in certain perspective, um, his companies are, are not as climate friendly as one would think, given that they make electric cars and other you know, climate friendly uh, products. So give us a sense of where you stand on this issue that some backlash about the ESG ratings, the backlash around um, you know, which companies should be uh, you know, rated highly or low and so on. Yeah, uh, it's interesting you say that, uh, Tamil, because again, if, if if you know, listening back to our conversation two years ago, one of the things that I predicted then was the term ESG uh, may not even exist in five to ten years' time, right? And more recently, we saw some you know uh, articles on ESG being cut into pieces, and then this is what's happening now, right? Mm -hmm. So it's actually I got it wrong. It's, it was much faster than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so so the E part is being now separated. The S the social side is being separated. G has always been there. So I'm not surprised uh, that there's been, uh, you know, uh, the breakdown of ESG into its components, and rightly so. So uh, anything that is new uh, and evolving is going to get flack, is going to get uh, uh, questioned, and, it, and ESG and ESG funds and ESG investment strategies uh, are rightly being questioned, you know, and 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 but only to make them better. So, you know, if you look at various regulators globally, again, just focusing on the ESG as an investment class, if you want to call it, uh, or, uh, if you look at all the regulators globally uh, from Europe with SFDR Article 8, 9 rules that have come in uh, to even MAS, uh, I think a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, came out with new ESG fund uh, disclosure requirements. HKMA had theirs last year. Australia ASIC came up with theirs last uh, month as well. We are finding that uh, in, in investors and invest in uh, ESG strategies, even climate strategies, um, are being monitored now as an investment class uh, and therefore uh, being required to step up and no longer can be sort of greenwashed and, and uh, you know, rainbow washed as, uh, as people often say. So, so this, is, this is part and parcel of an evolution of an uh, investment class, uh, asset class. And uh, that is required. Uh, I, I've been, uh, I, I, you know, I welcome it. I think it's great. It's making sure that fund managers who are claiming that they are spending time and effort, uh, like we are at an occupant, is doing and spending time on uh, as the environment side, social, human capital side, that, that they, they can prove it. Uh, and, and people who are not uh, or have no intentions of, that they they don't then participate in the space. So it's it's a welcome space. Um, I'm not fearful. Uh, most genuine ESG uh, or E investors are not fearful. If anything, welcome this. Um, so yeah, it makes us it makes the whole process a lot more crispus and correct and accurate.
Yeah, no, I mean, when it, the part of the data that you talk about, I think it is useful and and uh, relevant to measure a company's carbon footprint yeah. and the uh, steps it's taking to ameliorate that. Mixing that up with its human resource practices or diversity, um, I think, you know, we would all like every company to be noble and do the right thing. Uh, but as far as climate change is concerned, the, the environment doesn't really care about your human resource practice or the diversity for staff. So I think that, you know, as you said, that it's getting sliced up in a way is probably the right thing to do that, you know, if you are an activist investor who really cares about the S and the G part, it doesn't have to be attached to E and E should not be like a company like Tesla, which arguably is doing a lot for reducing our carbon footprint should not be mixed up with its, uh, again, you know, workplace environment and so on. Um, so uh, if I'm an investor, uh, where should I focus on as a climate or a carbon investor? Yeah. So, so, it's, uh, so as, as I said, the whole idea of climate investing is about uh, decarbonization, right? So, uh, and when people think of decarbonization, uh, the, the go-to, uh, let's say, uh, focus areas for investors tends to be the cost of carbon uh, the, or the price of carbon itself. Uh, and the, the second area that people go to is technology. Uh, they're the two things people think, OK, I can either invest in uh, carbon itself, the cost of carbon, or I can invest in technology that helps reduce the carbon uh, uh, footprint uh, and decarbonize. But I think there's a third element to that, which is uh, maybe less talked about. Uh, and I think very, very important. Without it, uh, you cannot, as an investor, make money on technology or on just pure following carbon prices. And that is policy. Uh, carbon policy that countries have, as I said, and these carbon policies of countries are still very national, uh, nationally focused, uh, at best regionally focused in the case of EU, but most of it is uh, 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 nationally focused. Now, if I to show you what I mean by this, first, if you look at carbon price uh, and and the cost of carbon, people often look at the carbon cost of an industry as a proxy for the investment opportunity, uh, and that is mathematically carbon price times volume. Volume is, for carbon is now identified under scope one, two, three. You can do it for a country, you can do it for a company, you can do it for a sector. You can even do it for you and I, right? Carbon volumes is fine. It's the carbon price that is very broad spectrum. So you have anywhere from carbon taxes of $2.50 in Mexico to 130 in Sweden. You know, you can have carbon prices that are under the compliance markets at 80 euros in Europe, or you can have under the East Coast RGDI initiative at six to twelve dollars. So you have carbon prices that are very broad range, even though we know the volume. So people who are looking at carbon cost in totality as an investment opportunity or focus area, I, I think where, what they need to do is they need to move it around and say, who is willing to pay for the cost of decarbonization? And what I mean by here is the people who are paying for decarbonization are, again, either the governments um, or through their, let's say, the EU uh, a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, for example, or tax uh, uh, government taxes, uh, or even, let's say, regulators like the California Air Board, uh, Air, Air Resources Board. They're paying for carbon decarbonization with their credit systems. Um, even, let's say, companies who have regulated carbon taxes, they would be willing to pay for carbon offsets because they know they've got the taxes to pay for. So for, 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 for most investors, I think one needs to look at who are the decarbonization payers? What is their size? What is their ambition? And what is their ability to pay? Because you, as a carbon investor, don't want to be relying uh, on someone who's promising you a price for carbon who then disappears in six months time. And I'll give you a, a live example of that, uh, is that if you uh, have a look, just last week, uh, India decided that they're not going to allow for any carbon offsets to be exported, right? Mm. So that means all carbon offsets in India are to be kept in India. So anyone who is relying on the carbon offsets or investing in carbon offsets from India to be exported to the rest of the world, now that's gone. That opportunity is gone because guess what? It was the policy around carbon dictated what the carbon market was doing in India. So that 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 sort of reminded me. And by the way, India was one of four countries that in the last few months have decided to 
stop their allowing their offsets to be exported. Indonesia being one one of them, Papua New Guinea another, Uruguay another. So so again, carbon policies superseded any kind of carbon pricing that you could get from a carbon market. Now, if you look at technology, again, uh, technology in a carbon uh, policy vacuum does not work. Uh, and but where there's a carbon policy or let's say carbon related or climate related policy is there to uh, encourage technology, it can it can flourish. And a prime example of that is hydrogen electrolyzers. We know hydrogen electrolyzers, uh, whether it be from fossil fuels or renewables, have been in working perfectly fine for the last hundred years. But guess what? Green hydrogen now is considered as one of the energy uh, sorry transition uh, for, uh, for for energy. And that is purely because over the last decade and a half, we had some serious policy incentives given to solar and to wind and other renewables that broke down the prices of renewables, which then can be deployed into green hydrogen uh, or to create green hydrogen. Okay. So technology was there for 100 years. You needed industrial policies to be ramped up to bring the input price cost down. And now there's plenty of also, if you go to Korea, who wants to become the hydrogen hub of the region, there's industrial policy that is incentivizing technology to be deployed. So uh, to answer your question, when people are looking to focus their investments, climate investing, just focusing on carbon prices or focusing on technology by itself is not good enough. Uh, one needs to focus on who are the decarbonizing payers and who are reliable, what is their size and ability to pay, and then also what is the carbon policy uh, that is being deployed in different areas in different regions and different sectors. That to me is another to go to place uh, for focus for uh, carbon investors. So it is very important given that you know we are in this nascent world, the Gatorade moment if you will, that the policy environment is something that investors should keep an eye on. So let's uh, you know, go around the world a little bit and talk a bit more about the policy environment. So you mentioned uh, some degree of climate nationalism out of India. Um, I have seen the Chinese do a lot of work with the Europeans in recent mm -hmm. years, whether it is taxonomy or getting their emission trading system going by looking at the experience of the Europeans and so on. And to your point about the recent bill passed in the U.S., ostensibly called Inflation Reduction Act, but Really, the focus there seems to be is on climate change. So are we seeing a lot of tailwind uh, with respect to climate regulation? And are the regulations going in the right direction? Um, it's interesting. Climate regulations have been going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth uh, in most countries other than Europe. Europe has been in fairly much consistently in one direction. Uh, yes, the back and forth is much smaller. But if you go to places like Australia or places like America, you've seen big back and forths, right? And that will continue. Uh, but if you look at somewhere like Europe, I think the, the consistency and the momentum has been maintained. And even with EU taxonomy and the Green Deal, and even some of the laws now that I mentioned, SFDR Article 8, 9 for investment vehicles, this consistency for uh, climate investing, climate change, uh, uh, policy making, carbon pricing, the, the CBAM that was brought into place, all of these things seem to be inconsistent. But I think one thing people need to keep in mind, uh, Europe is only 8 to 9% of total carbon footprint. So they can get to net zero uh, for themselves. That's only 9% of our problem. There's another 91% that, and a big part of that, which is coming out of Asia, is still growing, is still growing. Uh, even uh, if some of the uh, climate ambitions that were announced by Asian countries through their nationally determined contributions NDCs last year in Glasgow COP26. Incrementally, they were good. Incrementally, they were positive, even though the, let's say, the, the more uh, ambitious environmentalists would say it was not good enough. But incrementally, India saying they're going to be net zero by 27. 70. Uh, China saying they're going to be carbon neutral by, let's say, uh, uh, 2060. Even Australia coming back to, into the into the game and saying that they're going to reduce under the new Labour Party, they're going to they're going to reduce their carbon emissions by 40 percent relative to 2005. These are all positive incremental steps. So I think the the, the ambitions for most countries have definitely gotten stronger. Where I think there's a disconnect still, especially in Asia. If we and I'm going to just maybe 
focus on Asia. Where the disconnect is, is the policies that are going to be there to support and deliver some of these NDCs are not there. There's a massive disconnect, massive gap in industrial policy uh, design uh, tools, uh, frameworks uh, that need to be created within Asia. Uh, and uh, my team and I, we believe, and one of our areas of focus is exactly on that, is that we believe that there's going to be a tsunami of uh, policies, tools, frameworks created in Asia uh, to help them deliver on the NDCs. And they will take guidance and, and let's say, uh, uh, lessons learned from places like Europe. Uh, uh, and we already know that the European, let's say, carbon markets, the ETS carbon markets have been around for a while now, and they're in their third, fourth version. And now they're finally, I think, getting to a, a workable model uh, on three, four sectors. So I think the lessons learned from Europe will be deployed in Asia, but need to be deployed fairly quickly this decade if we want to have any chance of getting to our climate uh, cha change ambitions or prevention of that. So let's talk about that ETS issue a little more uh, because the Chinese have also taken cues from the Europeans and the various you know sort of setbacks they had in terms of getting the market to come up with a useful set of information on copper pricing to a sort of top down the regulators sort of setting the price and allowing the market to clear around that through volumes. Um, so carbon markets, I mean, we've been around for a while. Econ 101 suggests that's the way to internalize externalities. What's your view? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> again, instinctively, you and I, well, we've been trained that let the car let the markets do their job, right? And theoretically, a carbon market, what is its job? It's a carbon market. Uh, by the way, let's take a step back for, for our listeners. There's two types of carbon markets. Uh, there's one, the compliance market, the regulated market that is controlled or regulated by either a regulator, such as, the, as I said, the California Air Resource Board, or by a government such as the EU, uh, doing the EU ETS, right? That's the compliance market. Then there's the voluntary market. And here what I'll be talking about is more the compliance market because the voluntary market is still very small, uh, even though it's growing, but it's still very small. So if you look at the compliance market for carbon, uh, its job is to, theoretically, is to make sure that the price of carbon is stable and slowly, gradually increasing so that it puts pressures on the polluters of carbon to and incentivize them to find ways to either reduce their carbon footprint or to just get out of that whole game altogether because it's going to become too costly if carbon prices continue to go up that's that's the theoretical and that kind of makes sense the the problem uh, and this is my again my humble view is that over the last 20 or so years that we've had various forms of and your ets being the most the oldest uh, form uh, of carbon compliance market the, the problem is that we have not seen a stable rising uh, carbon price, let alone a reduction in carbon emissions by the participants of those markets. So that leads me to believe uh, that there is some inherent problem. Mm. Uh, if we haven't sorted it out for 20 years, there's some underlying challenges uh, to the structure of those compliance markets that need to be addressed. And, and what are the challenges? The challenges are that most compliance markets, when they get set and put in place, their, and their prices have not gone up, it is because the government uh, or the regulator has given out free allowances, free credits to certain industries or sectors who are participating in that market uh, because they're political, because the voter bank, if, 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 if they didn't get those uh, allowances, the price or the carbon impact of that industry would be so tremendous that uh, the, the political parties bringing it on, they'd be out the next uh, voting session, right? So the, the allowances were one of the problems. Uh, secondly, you also have a lot of these allowances being allowed to be carried forward for much longer than they should have. So they kept the prices down, and that was another problem. And then there was a little bit uh, of, let's say, voluntary carbon offsets. And again, I think what you were referring to, Temur, was that uh, the EU ETS and one of the one of the reasons people blame uh, for its initial failure was that there was a significant amount of carbon offsets that were being exported from China into uh, EU, and uh, and that was a problem that has been rectified, uh, and that's why you are finding that the EU after 
20 years of, and version 3 or 4 is finally got its EU ETS kind of stable and they've, they've got their own reserve management system that is excluded all these offsets. Uh, so they're the three reasons why prices have not uh, been stable and not been good enough incentives for polluters to feel uncomfortable because they've been able to get away either through free allowances or prices staying low. Uh, the other problem with uh, these markets, carbon markets, or I should say challenge, uh, uh, structural challenge, is that the money that the governments generate from these, right? Because every time the government issues some of these credits for people, they're supposed to get uh, money that can be deployed in climate action, right? Uh, Europe, for example, uh, had $14 billion worth of credits issued uh, in the last round. That money doesn't and has not been fairly deployed uh, into pure climate action, right? Uh, even the allocation of these monies in Europe from the EU ETS system, if you look at the breakdown of the percentages that went to com countries within the EU that actually had no climate ambitions versus those that were actually deploying climate ambitions, it was disproportionate. Uh, again, political structures of EU, same way in California, how the money gets sort of uh, what they call green pork, uh, pork barreling is happening uh, at the moment. So a lot of the deployment is, is just out of whack uh, from a revenue from a revenue allocation perspective. So there are some of the challenges, inherent challenges that you can find that in, in my view are uh, sort of keeping uh, carbon markets from delivering what you and I would otherwise expect. And, and they're not going away. Sadly, the, the last reason why this doesn't work is that when you put four or five, six sectors in to be covered by one, let's say, carbon market. Let's say you put transport, you put uh, uh, metals and mining, you put aviation, you put uh, industrial production, all of these under a carbon uh, electricity generation, all under, let's say, one carbon market and say, okay, all you four emitters in country X, you're going to be participating in this carbon market, buy, sell credits and your cap and trade schemes. What ends up happening is that the sector with the lowest carbon ambition becomes, if it's big enough and can vote out the next government, they bring the whole structure of the carbon market down. And that is, again, where the politics yeah. uh, of carbon and its impact uh, just make for carbon markets to become less effective. And that's why, uh, again, my uh, humble opinion is that carbon markets will be there. They will take longer than we think to come up with a fair, stable carbon price. We should not completely discount them. They let them operate. But in the in the meantime, industrial policy and carbon policies from governments targeted, uh, focused, uh, so that they can deliver their NDCs need to come into place. We can't just wait for carbon markets to sort themselves out. Uh, very, very well taken. Uh, I think the, you know, similar sort of, you know, one step forward, one step backward has been also characteristic of China's emissions trading system. They're also trying to get it right, but it's pretty hard to get it right at the first go, it seems like. Um, when, he, he, when I look at this Inflation Reduction Act that the U.S. Uh, has now put in action, uh, and I compare it with large legislations of the past, whether it's in the U.S. or elsewhere, I see a switch in tactic, and I want to hear your view on this issue. It seems to me that now, for the reasons that you mentioned, that if you do something very draconian, you're vulnerable in the next election cycle. So the thinking behind the latest package out of the U.S. seems to be more carrot than sticks. I give you incentives and tax credit to embrace climate action as opposed to I penalize you for being a large emitter. Uh, do you think this is astute and has a greater chance of success than the previous regimes, which seem to be more about I'll tax you, I'll penalize you, I'll put quotas on you? Yeah. No, I, so there's a uh, in the carbon policy, climate policy world, there is no doubt a debate around this that is carrots better than sticks, right? Uh, and and you know, for everything I I will say, there'll be many people who will say I'm wrong and they're right on this. So take it for what it's worth from me. Uh, carbon sticks have not worked. Mm. Uh, uh, sorry. Penalties have not worked, and they've not worked because people have gotten away with it. Then they've gotten away with it for various reasons. Uh, and again, I don't need to go into company, the country, regional reasons for them, but they have gotten away from it. Uh, carbon taxes uh, or carbon rebates, uh, car sorry, 
carb- tax rebates because of carbon reduction. Uh, you know that seems to have been uh, have had a much better uh, and focused uh, uh, result from my reading, uh, and therefore I think. Um, deploying that rather than having to penalize people, but then also let them have an out through, let's say, going and buying carbon offsets from here, there, and everywhere, which people have been doing. That's one way to sort of uh, sort of neutralize your penalties is go and buy. Again, one of my fears is that if you keep on pushing the penalties, it incentivizes people to go and find solutions to get out of it. And the voluntary carbon market, if left unchecked, could easily provide that out, you know, because regulated are regulators, but voluntary uh, and finance, the finance sector is very good at securitizing things. So, uh, you know, give finance folks a, a, you know, an opportunity to securitize a, a carbon offset and sell it to someone who otherwise would be penalized. You're, you're playing into that space, which I think ha- can lead us to a fake transition as opposed right. to a transition. So I think having uh, actually incentives and carrots is a much better approach uh, than if you just keep on penalizing. It, it's going to be it's going to work both ways. And some of the best policies are where you do say to people to industries that if you do X Y Z, you will get priority when you're bidding or when you're tendering uh, in in let's say government projects and all the rest. And those folks who are not by the way, you'll be excluded. That's a penalty, right? And that's a penalty where they don't have to go and cheat too much. For them to sort of step up, they need to step up. So there are ways to penalize people other than just throwing, you know, uh, penalties, taxes, uh, sorry, uh, uh, taxes and penalties on them. Right. I think, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think um, the tobacco industry is a great cautionary tale about the limits of penalties and taxes that mm-hmm. can, uh, you know, achieve the desired goal versus, you know, maybe mass education and incentives and so on. Um, So, okay, Uh, beyond this issue of the market failure and regulatory capture and the carrot stick strategy, is there any major risk in the area of climate investing that we haven't touched on yet? Yeah, Uh, I mean, climate investing is, again, as we've said, is is early days, so we're going to see more and more risks emerge uh, as we go through. I think the very the first risk as a climate investor is: do we have enough time? Mm. I think time is a big issue. Have have we left it too late? Right, uh, and that is a discussion uh, to be had on a on a, in a different sort of uh, podcast with much more uh, well informed people on whether or not we have left it too late. Uh, because as I said, uh, climate investing is about risk, return, and impact. Will we be able to deliver the impact that we're investing for fast enough is is uh, a big risk that anyone going into this space, will they come out of this in five years, 10 years time and say, but I, the impact happened, but it was too late. Uh, so that's, that's a risk. And I think that will take its time. Uh, the second uh, risk, I think, in climate investing, okay, and this is not in climate change, mitigation, adaptation that companies are doing, this is for investors. Uh, is the funds management industry or the providers of uh, um, investment vehicles, my peers, uh, the, the whole greenwashing concept and idea that you brought up, uh, p- providing genuine uh, uh, climate investing vehicles uh, with impact, that is going to that is a big uh, risk as well. That we don't do that. We don't do it well enough, and people kind of lose interest or as you rightly said earlier on um, um, you know people uh, start questioning it and therefore give up on it and i think the the the, the genuine climate uh, products investment vehicles with no green washing giving confidence to investors is the second biggest risk uh, and and i'm glad that that's being tackled on by various fronts, one with data coming in much more so that me and my team uh, can come up and, and deliver, uh, you know, uh, impact uh, numerics, but also the regulators making sure that myself and my peers are kept uh, held accountable to what claims we're making. So that's the second risk. And I think the third risk and uh, that we touched upon briefly was this, uh, you know, uh, for me is, again, the, the ability of financial markets to securitize intangibles, uh, you know, 
especially when you have something that is uh, hard to monitor as it is, which is carbon, uh, whether carbon is being emitted or not emitted. Uh, it's a science, it's a science, but it's not. You, you, you cannot sort of uh, prove it in some ways. Uh, if something cannot be sort of let's say monitored uh, that easily, and only a few people are measuring it, and no one's regulating it, but someone's securitizing it. <laughs> you're leading to potentially a challenge uh, for uh, climate investing and the financial securitization of carbon. And again, we go back to the whole climate investing is what is the price of carbon? How do we incorporate it into our systems? If we financially securitize carbon in a way uh, which uh, is done with the view that this is for just transition, but it ends up being a fake transition because one, we didn't deliver on those you know, uh, carbon reduction targets that uh, this was supposed to do. Uh, and also we took many people down the, you know, the, the wrong path, uh, showed them ways to sort of uh, claim offsets when they weren't there. That is something uh, that can be damaging not only to the investing, climate investing uh, universe, but also to the, you know, to, let's say to the, to, to those people who, for whom we're trying to get just transition, right? Uh, whether that be the indigenous people who are living off the land and, and uh, are trying to sort of uh, benefit from that and also support uh, with legitimate carbon offsets. If we, for example, tell them that the price of carbon offset is X, Y, Z, and then it turns out that five years later, they've given up all their other activities and focused on this only to find out that, that those offsets are not being internationally accepted and that the price is not 100 bucks, it's like not even a buck. That's going to become not a just transition for them. It's going to be a costly transition for them. So I think that's my third and last sort of risk is that how do we do, how do we make sure uh, that in, you know, as we move towards a just transition and create these carbon uh, markets, especially the voluntary ones, that we do it in a way that does not lead to uh, a fake transition for ourselves and even for, let's say, the people who, who really uh, are, we should be benefiting uh, in the process. So that's the third risk to climate investing. Right. No, they're, they're sobering ones. Uh, no, no doubt about it, uh, Muneeb. Um, now, your mandate is global. You look at sectors and companies all over the world, but you're based in Asia, your investor base, I think, is largely Asian, and you do look at a lot of Asian companies. Yeah. Um, so give us a sense of the state of the war against climate change in Asia. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, climate change in Asia, again, uh, the approach we've taken at Parky Partners is there's a two, it's a two-pronged approach, a bottom-up uh, approach of looking at companies and that, uh, the other one is a top-down approach. If I start with the top-down approach, as I mentioned earlier on, as we as we were discussing, that Asian countries' uh, climate ambitions uh, are becoming better and better uh, incrementally, uh, with most companies having in COP26 come out with incrementally better targets uh, uh, related to climate and also uh, separately on some environmental issues as well. But climate, definitely, they've gotten better. Is it good enough? Uh, many people would argue not good enough. But to me, I'm one of those. I take the incremental change as a positive start. The absolutes uh, will, will catch up hopefully over time. Uh, but when we look at it from the policy perspective to support those NDCs, then there's a massive gap, uh, as I said, you know, in what they're trying to achieve under the NDCs and what their policies are in place. So I, I think Asia's impact uh, in terms of uh, helping the global climate change challenge is very much from a top-down perspective going to be driven by uh, whether or not the countries, whether it be India, China, Australia, Singapore, everyone in, in, in Asia are actually delivering the policies to support uh, uh, their specific NDCs. So that's one way that one needs to map out Asia uh, to see what's happening at, at the margin. Are they doing the right thing? Uh, just looking at targets by themselves, maybe not good enough. You've got to follow it. The follow follow down to the policies. If you look at it from a bottom up perspective, uh, uh, my team and I, over the last uh, you know a couple of years since we last we last spoke, we've spent time uh, creating our own climate uh, and environmental frameworks, and one of them is our climate mapping framework. And we've also got a database of about 450 Asian companies uh, that either have have a CDP or SBTI or a transition pathway initiative based data. 
that we have focused on with, and with the aim that we want to see companies uh, and their industries and what is their actual climate footprint or an environmental footprint? Is it high or low? And then we want to map it against, are these companies actually making an effort to reduce their climate uh, or their carbon footprint or their environmental footprint? And when we overlay the company country policy, uh, let's say, initiatives onto our mapping of the company and sector plans, it gives us a very interesting sort of uh, picture of on the ground what is happening from a company and an investor's perspective. There are, and and you know some of this is going to be uh, a bit of a are going to be sort of uh, hashed out in our. Uh, we have a Asian Environmental Action Fund uh, planned uh, in the coming months. Uh, many of the companies in there will be. Uh, a result of this analysis that we're doing to show what kind of environment impact uh, that they can make. And Asian companies can have a massive environmental impact. I'll just give you an example of one Asian in, uh, company. Uh, one company in Japan won't name the company, but its scope three carbon emission is 435 million tons. 435 million tons, right? And by the way, the second, and that's scope three. Uh, there are, we have other uh, Asian companies who scope one and two are about 250 million tons, right? So we're talking massive. And to put it in perspective, the whole of Japan's carbon emissions is about 1 billion tons. Yes. So 435 million tons from one company, that's their scope three. So if you can get companies like that on your radar, but also with very strong, let's say, environmental actions in place, as an investor, that impact becomes easier to achieve uh, because the size and scale in Asia of the, the carbon footprint or the climate footprint is massive uh, compared to some of the developed market companies that most people are used to investing in. So I think Asia presents some great opportunities to help uh, the fight on climate change. Uh, but how you go about doing it, you've got to be very, very careful uh, and sensible about it. Wow. Yeah. So those numbers are um, kind of in a way exciting because then you sort of underscore the point that how much potential Asia has in contributing to the uh, global aim toward, you know, net zero. Um, Muni, uh, what about financial returns? Back on episode 16, when you uh, you had envisaged that the companies you select for your investment criteria will prosper over companies that are not prepared for climate change uh, because of the regulation and the taxes that were coming. Well, the last two years, as we have discussed, we have seen numerous announcements on carbon taxes and border adjustment tax, emission targets, etc. So the thesis that companies that are ahead of the game will prosper more and provide better return, has it panned out? Yeah, it's a good question. So if, if, in the same uh, uh, call uh, back in 2020, one thing I did say, Temur, is that uh, for companies that are incorporating uh, human, social, environmental capital into their business models, right, uh, ahead of their peers. Uh, the, the, the financial results or the, even the impact results should be a three to five year game. And so from that perspective, I think uh, for uh, many of our companies, the jury is still out both actually on the impact side, uh, we're convinced that they've been delivering on their human, social, environmental capital progress. On the financial side, uh, the jury is still out for, for many of the companies in our portfolio. Uh, if I was to break down our portfolio companies into the E part, the E part, uh, there is definitely uh, our companies who have climate or environment as a tailwind in their business models. Uh, examples being in the space of like the HVAC system, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning uh, 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 sector, or whether it be the electric, uh, electri electrification industry. They definitely, in the last two, three years since we've spoken, have delivered uh, better than their own past performance and also against their peers. Uh, it's interesting, says, even in this, even in this, uh, let's say, downturn that we've had, the global recession fears that have been created in the last, let's say, six months time, uh, the cyclicality uh, and the nature of these companies being part of the global cycle has come through. They have, uh, they have suffered as well. But the, the, their, when you listen to them and speak to them, their, uh, their, you could say, um, uh, outlook is better than most don't have 
the tailwinds of climate and environment behind him. So it gives us conviction and, and strength in our view that uh, having tailwinds of climate solutions and environmental uh, is, is a good tailwind to have. So I think the financial return uh, from that perspective, uh, we're confident of. Uh, one of the things that, again, I, I would like to mention is that, and we, when we started this conversation, is that anyone who's coming coming into climate investing, right, they're already coming in with, the, with this new uh, mindset that they're looking for impact uh, and they're looking for risk-adjusted returns with impact. So the impact part is very much going to be the driver of anyone coming into this investment space. Uh, if you look at us, us and our portfolio uh, that we're planning, it is going to be based on uh, an absolute return approach where we're going to share with our uh, investors that there's a certain percentage return uh, that we aim to deliver. But more importantly, it's going to be returns with impact. So the impact part of that we're going to have to really identify what that impact is going to be in terms of carbon emission reductions, intensity reductions, uh, in terms of peak carbon, uh, especially if we're looking at climate, but we're looking also at other environmental issues. So I think the definition of returns, especially for climate investors, is going to be and is already the conversation is a very different conversation to when we last spoke, where a lot of people looked at uh, ESG investing and still compared it to some index returns. Mm. Uh, some benchmark returns. Here, the conversation on climate investing starts with show me the climate impact first and then tell me to get that climate impact, what is the financial, uh, let's say, makeup or, uh, or expected return that you think you can get out of it? So it's, it's it, for, for climate investing, I think people going into it should be and are focused on the climate impact and then what kind of financial returns one could expect from that universe of companies. Because let's face it, that universe of companies is going to be a very different universe of companies than your broader index that most people compare their financial returns to. So it's it's a conversation that we are having with our uh, partners on right. the expected returns. But I but first glance of our sort of model portfolio, uh, a five to seven percent per annum return uh, sh should be deliverable uh, in an Asia PAC context. Also, I'd like to think that as more and more countries and companies come under the the sort of the umbrella of focusing on uh, net zero, uh, that the investment base will become broader and broader. At one point, Muni, you might have to start benchmarking this is because every company will be an ESG company. <laughs> I look forward to that day. <laughs> uh, probably not two years from now. <laughs> yeah, no, no. no. Uh, Muni, it has been great having you back on the show. So I really, really want to thank you very much for your time and insights. No, no, Tamu, thank you so much. And I do look forward to uh, Copy Time 150 when you and I will be having another uh, chat and, uh, you know, talking about something new, something different, uh, an evolution of ESG to something new and something very, very positive for the earth and for our portfolios. I want to thank Munib and thank our listeners as well. Kopi Time was produced by Ken Delbridge from Spy Studios. Daisy Sharma and Violet Lee provided additional production assistance. This podcast is for information only and does not represent any trade recommendations. All 83 episodes of Kopi Time are available on YouTube and on all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day.